Hello and welcome everyone to today's MIT Abstract on Making at MIT with graduate student Rima Das. I'm your host, Fatima Hussein, and I'm a PhD candidate studying ancient earth. Now, before we begin, I'd like to cue you in to what an abstract actually is. An abstract is simply a snapshot or a summary of a greater work of research or writing. Today, I have the honor to introduce you to our illustrious guest today, Rima Das. She's a graduate student in the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering, and she thinks a lot about making. I'm really excited for this. Welcome, Rima. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, as Fatima said, I am Rima. I am a third year student. I'm a PhD candidate in the MIT Ideation Lab, which is in mechanical engineering. And I'm so excited to be talking to you a little bit about art and engineering and my journey with making at MIT and kind of what that means. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on who I am, um, I am a like I said, I'm a graduate student now. I actually also did my undergrad here at MIT. You can see a picture of me um, from graduation here. And I'm originally from Michigan. So I don't know if any of you are from there or have been there, but um, I included a little project that I did that um, in the medals class that I took here where I uh, made a, a metal sculpture representing Michigan and where I was from. And one of the reasons why I wanna talk to you about making today is because here at MIT, it's actually a really big part of the culture and about kind of our attitude towards engineering. So when MIT was founded a long, long time ago, 1861, you can see the MIT seal here. Um, they came up with this motto, mens et manus. And what this really means is mind and hand. So the idea here is that someone who's going to be an engineer, you should really know, you should know the theory, you should know science and math and all of those great things, but you also should know kind of the practical side. So how to make stuff, how to build stuff, how do things actually work in the physical world? And so you can see that kind of reflected in the seal here where you have on the right, somebody who's, you know, studying, looking at the books, but on the left, you have this woman who's a craftswoman who's, you know, forging something made of metal, you know, actually building something physical. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my kind of journey into this mind and hand ethos and where it started for me. So my personal experience with making stuff and building stuff actually came from the world of arts and crafts. And I don't know if that, that's something that any of you all enjoy, but growing up, I was always, you know, you know, cutting things out of paper, gluing things together, making crafts, doing different projects. So I've included a couple here that I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, things that I do. So in the top left there, you'll see a little crochet dragon that I made. I really love to crochet. I think you might even be able to see um, some in my background, uh, things that I've made, like blankets and things like that. Um, below that is a mug. I actually even brought it with me today for my tea. Um, we have a really amazing pottery studio here at MIT, and I've gotten really into doing, you know, making different kinds of pots and pans and bowls and mugs and all kinds of fun stuff and experimenting with color and glaze and things like that. So really getting into throwing on the pottery wheel. Another cool thing uh, that I've been doing is glass blowing. So in the middle here, you'll see three of these really cool paperweights that I learned how to make. Um, we've got a glass lab here. So you work with, you know, molten glass and you can make things like cups and, um, you know, all kinds of sculptural things, uh, which is super exciting as well. Um, another really cool part of MIT's culture is a lot of times our dorms will let us paint the walls. Um, so in the top here, you'll see an image, um, a couple of friends of mine uh, and I worked together during undergrad to paint this big wall mural in my dorm room. And so that was really fun because we got to kind of make the space our own. It was really a bright a bright thing to look at and enjoy during the cold winter months. Um, and it was a really fun project to do as a group. And um, and then below that, you'll see I've gotten really into making different kinds of laser cut projects. So, so here is a clock that I made of some of my favorite women from different books that I love. So you might recognize characters like Hermione and Pippi Longstocking and Matilda and Mary Poppins and Nancy Drew. Uh, so these are some of my kind of favorite characters that I brought into this clock that I made. And then on the right here is another really special project. Um, we have a tradition here called the Trash and Show. Um, and that's kind of focused around sustainability and, you know, making things out of unconventional materials and recycling and all that kind of thing. And so the goal is to make really things that look like they're, you know, high fashion, but you're making it out of weird materials. So I made this peacock inspired dress made out of, you know, 
trash bags, party tablecloths, that kind of thing. So I worked really hard on putting this together. And then there was a whole fashion show at the end where everybody exhibited their different designs. So really a variety of things that I've done, you know, kind of on the art side. And so when I got to MIT as an uh, as a freshman um, in undergrad, I did not know what I wanted to major in. And I was like, you know, I like math and science, uh, so probably I'll do something kind of engineering related, but I don't really know what that means. And I took this really phenomenal class that we have in the mechanical engineering department called toy product design. And that class basically takes you through the whole design process, but in the context of building a toy. Um, and when I was taking that, I was like, oh, you know, we're building things and we're making things and we're doing things that are really hands-on. All of that is the same kinds of things that I've really loved in the world of crafts. I actually really enjoy this. And so that's really what motivated me to become a mechanical engineer is that love of continuing to build things and make things. So here's some of the engineering kind of projects that I worked on. On the left, that's that toy that we made. It's an earthquake uh, toy where you're building something and trying to get it to not shake and fall down. It's the platform shaking and you're competing with a partner. It's a very kind of high intensity fun game. And then in the middle, if any of you have seen Star Wars, you might recognize our friend BB-8. Um, and so this was for a manufacturing class that I took where you are trying to make 50 yo-yos. So for our yo-yo design, we wanted our BB-8 yo-yo to kind of have the same movement pattern as BB-8 does in the movie. So if you've seen it, you know that, you know, the body rolls around and the head kind of stays stationary um, with respect to the body. So we came up with a way with magnets to get that same kind of motion replicated in our yo-yo that we made. So that was a very, very cool project and, you know, fun to learn manufacturing and how to make things at scale, but also have that sort of creative element. And then on the right, um, you saw a picture actually Fatima uh, included in my intro where I was presenting something on stage and maybe you noticed in the background there was a grand piano and so this is a project that we made um, my senior year of undergrad and it's a sheet music page turner for musicians. So if any of you play an instrument and use sheet music, you might know that uh, it's actually really hard if you're using both of your hands to play the piano or play, you know, a wind instrument that requires all of your hands. Uh, it's really hard to turn the page uh, when you get to the end. And so everybody has to kind of pause and you have to turn your page and it, you know, interrupts the flow of music. And so this is a device that uses a foot pedal to do that for you, which is really, really cool. Um, and you can still use physical sheet music, which is something that a lot of musicians wanted to be able to continue to do. Um, so here's a couple of those, those types of projects that I worked on. So now I want to talk a little bit about like, what do I do now? So actually for my graduate work, I'm not really building anything or making anything as part of my research, but what I am doing is studying how other people do that. So there's two sort of spheres that I look at. One is at sketching. So you might've seen, you know, I love to draw, I love to do, you know, painting, that kind of thing. And I also like to make things that are, you know, one step further in the kind of physical realm. So that kind of mirrors what the design process looks like at the early stages when you're coming up with new ideas, you can sketch them. That's a really great way to communicate your ideas to other people on your team. And then when you're trying to figure out more details about, you know, is this actually going to work? What are our major questions? You want to start building things that are a little bit more physical to start answering some of those questions. So essentially, I study how people sketch and how people engage with maker spaces. So I'll tell you a little bit about each of those kind of two spheres of my work um, in a little bit. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what kind of, you know, visual elements I keep talking about sketching and making. How does this fall into the design process? So here I have kind of an example of different kinds of what we call design artifacts that might show up at different stages of the design process. So like I mentioned early on, when you're doing ideation and brainstorming, you might come up with a lot of physical ideas that you're just sketching by hand. Uh, and then in prototyping, you're making simple models. Concept refinement, you might go back to sketching and drawing, but in a little bit more detail. And um, then you might get to engineering drawing where you're starting to make models in the computer and things with the dimensions and more details. Um, and then you have a final product where it's something you can actually use. So I'll walk you through this in the context of uh, one of the projects that I worked on that was super fun. So this is a project that I did that was related to making an escape room. And a really cool part of this is that it was themed around as if you're in Candyland. So we were trying to come up with an idea for a fun escape room, physical experience, um, that kind of 
relates to this candy theme. So the overall idea was you are basically stuck in a giant jar of jelly beans. Uh, you're tiny and this is a giant jar. So you're like trying to follow the lights in this room and escape from the jelly bean jar. Um, and so the lights in the room would change different colors. So if the lights were red, you want to make sure that all of your limbs are on the red jelly beans. Now, if the lights are purple, you can be on red ones and blue ones. Kind of you want to be in equal amounts. So it was a little bit of that like color mixing, but also scrambling around a rock wall. So we started, you can see on the left with drawings of what this might look like. Below that, you can see a little model that we made with a pipe cleaner stick figure and actual jelly beans for scale. Then we learn how to model a jelly bean and actually make molds uh, to create these physical jelly bean holds for the final rock wall. And then we actually built the whole thing. So this is, you know, you see a couple of different stages of what we did with sketches and prototypes throughout um, this experience. So to dive a little bit into that first stage of sketching, um, Typically, the way that I do this is I'll give people an engineering design problem. So in this case, here's a couple of images that people came up with when I said, come up with a way that we can froth milk. So you might have, you know, different different sketches. These aren't necessarily like refined drawings, but these are kind of people thinking through their ideas. So what I do is I try to then take this and actually break down some of the physical elements of what they're sketching. So not necessarily the idea itself and the concept, but actually visual elements of their sketches. So what does that mean? Let me give you some examples. One difference that you can see in the sketch is line smoothness. So here we have two different images. You can tell that they're both bikes, but on the one on the left, the lines are really wavy. They're kind of shaky. It's a little bit more wobbly. Um, and on the right, it's a lot more smooth. You know, neither one is the best sketch in the world, but the one on the right looks a lot kind of cleaner and smoother. Another metric that I like to use is proportion and accuracy. So again, both of these images do a pretty decent job with communication, um, but the one on the left, like the wheels are different sizes. They're, neither of them are really circular. It's kind of, again, you know, nothing is in the exact shape or spot that you think it should be. But on the right, again, it's kind of like wobbly and shaky, but the things, everything that's part of the bike is in the right spot and, you know, looks generally proportional and accurate. And the last one, this is a metric that I actually developed. It's called understandability. And what does that mean? It basically means how good is your sketch at communicating what you're trying to draw? So here again, we have two bike images. The one on the right, it's it's really simple. We don't even have the spokes on the wheels, right? But it's easy to look at that and say, oh yeah, that looks like a bike. It's not the best drawing in the world, but I can look at it and say, yeah, that looks like a bike. The one on the left, almost the same exact lines as the one on the right, but it's missing some critical information, right? We don't have the handlebars, we don't have the seat. Um, and so all of a sudden that I'm like, is that abstract art? Is this like a map or, of something? You know, I'm just not sure. Um, so that's a low understandability drawing. So essentially these are some of the things that I assess. And now switching into kind of the making side, uh, the way that I got into this was I actually was a teacher in a makerspace and I ran different projects for kids like you um, around your age. So we did things like building hydroponic gardens and creating interactive music systems. And I even got to do some muraling with them, which is very cool since, um, you know, that's something that I really love to do. So now I study at the undergraduate level what makes makerspaces inclusive? What makes them easy to use? What makes them a place that you want to go to? What makes them fun? And I actually get to talk to people who use different makerspaces on campus and hear about their experiences. And one of the things that I've done as part of this kind of endeavor is try to map out where are the different makerspaces that exist on campus. Um, and actually there's a ton, there's like 50 or 100 makerspaces. Uh, some of them are really formal, some of them are informal. There's a bunch that are actually in people's dorms. The one in my dorm has a 3D printer. Uh, the one in a building that I used to live has like a laser cutter too. Um, I mentioned that I do pottery. There's a student art association where you can do things like pottery and painting and photography and learning all of that. Um, one of the really cool ones that we have is a biomaker space. That's something that I had never heard of before, um, but it's something that we have here where people get to do different kind of biological projects and they get to, I know there's one team that's working on programmable mud, which I don't really know what that means, but it sounds really, really cool. And they're getting to work with all these kinds of interesting biological um, living things and, and all kinds of like 
you know, bacteria and microbes and, and cool stuff like that and actually getting to do experiments with that. And then, of course, there's our more traditional spaces that maybe are run by staff. Um, and so it's very cool to get to hear people's experiences and why they choose to engage in the ones that they engage in, what would make them want to engage more and that kind of thing. So that's something that I've really been working on as well. So Super excited to be here and present with you. And I'm, I would love to answer any questions that you have about any of this work. And if you're more curious about some of the things that I've done, I included the link to my portfolio as well. So you can see more pictures of some of my projects too. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. That is super, super cool. So while we're waiting for uh, Nordangle students to ask their burning questions in the Q&A chat, I wanted to start us off with a question about about maker spaces in general. So, yeah. uh, you know, what, what machines, what instrumentation, what are the things that you would find in a good maker space? And could students, you know, if they don't already have one at their school, design a maker space themselves? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a couple of kind of different directions that maker spaces can use. Uh, one, one thing that I'll say is often one of the most important pieces of equipment in a makerspace is actually a couch. Um, one of the key things that makes a makerspace really successful is having space for community in addition to having specific machines. And there's been a lot of research that talks about, you know, a makerspace isn't just a room full of tools. It's actually kind of this community space. And so having space for people to engage with making, even if they're not actually physically building something at the moment, is so important. Um, on a more practical level, if you're thinking about ways to get into this, a lot of equipment that's, you know, really good starter equipment is just hand tools, right? So things like drills and hammers and, you know, exacto knives, things to be able to do some of that like low level prototyping. And then a level up from that is if you want some, you know, more refined digital modeling, you can have something like a laser cutter. I think 3D printers have become really popular in schools. My personal opinion actually is that a laser cutter often tends to be a little bit easier to get into and easier to, you know, build your own skills um, with that than a 3D printer is. Um, and you can use the 2D model version of things in the laser cutter to actually build 3D models like you would with 3D printing, um, but it's a little bit more kind of interactive. So for somebody looking to, for really, if, you, if I had to say like one machine that you should get, that would be the laser cutter for me. Um, and then, you know, there's things like drill presses and band saws, and then even later kind of mills and lathes, these kind of go up in, in sort of their level of um, training that you need to be able to use them. But those are some of the things that kind of make sense to get, but it also really depends on what kinds of materials you're trying to use and what type of making you want to do, because, um, you know, my recommendations vary a lot based on why you want to make and what you're trying to make and all of that. So totally. that's starting. <laughs> Yeah, that that totally makes sense. And for students who are just interested in in getting started, you know, making in, in general, and, and maybe their school doesn't have a makerspace, maybe they don't have the ability to, you know, pick which instruments to buy. Maybe you can't buy a laser cutter necessarily. Yeah. You know, can folks find lasers like or can folks find makerspaces in their communities? I know you had an amazing map of all the ones at MIT, but you know, where where else could you find makerspaces? Are they just everywhere? That's a great question. Yeah, there's a lot of community maker spaces that exist in different um, different spaces. One of the most common spaces actually where there's community making equipment is libraries. Often they'll have like different equipment that you can book or you can come in and use. And um, it's, you know, the same way you check out a book, you can actually go there and either check out equipment or use equipment there. So that's something that's, that's really cool. Um, there's others that, you know, they might, you might have to become a member or something like that, get training. Usually that's one of the things that, um, because there's some level of training that's needed from a safety perspective, there's usually always kind of a process to get involved, but there's a lot of spaces that exist outside of academic environments. And then, you know, if there's like a school or a university in your area that has a makerspace, sometimes those will actually even be open to the broader community. So that's another space to look where, um, there might be kind of existing spaces that you can you can leverage and get involved with. Oh, that that is that is great to hear, and I'm sure you know students can ask their teachers as, as well where to go. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit now to thinking about art and 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 making. So yeah. one of our North English students is wondering, you know, they they mention your emphasis on sketching here. You know, should should students be taking art classes, and are you taking any art classes at MIT right now? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I'm a really, you know, I think this will come as a huge surprise, not at all to everybody in this, in this uh, call, but I'm a really huge proponent of kind of the art and engineering sides of my experience being really, really uh, beneficial to each other. I think being an artist makes me a better engineer and vice versa. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. One of the internships that I did when I was an undergrad was I actually worked at Universal Studios working on a new Harry Potter ride there. So if any of you have been, it's the Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. But we have this experience there um, where the engineering team and the art team was really kind of separate from one another, and they were having such a hard time communicating. So there was this disagreement of like, okay, we want to do something with the theming of the ride vehicle. And the engineers were saying, well, that's going to be too heavy if we do all this theming and then the ride's not going to move. So then we're not going to have a ride. And the art team was saying, well, if we don't do the theming properly, you know, we're we're not going to get approval from Warner Brothers to be able to do this. And we're not going to have a ride. And so both teams are kind of like they're butting heads, but really they needed to come to a kind of compromise. So they told me, they said, you seem like you understand both sides of this. You understand you know, the art language and the engineering language, like, can you be our go-between and actually help us talk to each other? And so I think there's this lack of understanding in the broader community that what you're, what you care about and what you're doing is actually really similar and you're on the same team. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity there for people to really see them as, as interlinked. Um, to address the second part of the question, like I mentioned, I'm taking pottery classes. Uh, I do glass blowing. Um, I haven't taken an art class for credit since starting grad school, but I did do some in undergrad um, through the the architecture and art department here. So, wow. yeah. And we have a, a student, a North Anglia student, Smyan, and Smyan's asking, when did you start making art? Was this something you were doing long before you got to MIT and then, you know, fell into to maker spaces and tied together or, you know, tell us what that's like. Yeah, that's a great question, Smyan. Um, I, yeah, I would say from a very young age, I was interested in, you know, doing art. Like I love to, you know, draw and do little crafts and things like that when I was really young. Um, it's something that, yeah, it was, it's something that's kind of been part of my life for a long time, um, just because I've always been kind of a creative person. Uh, I just didn't make that link later as, you know, I thought I was like, oh, I really like doing art and I really like that side of things. And let me put that aside because I also like math and science. And I didn't realize that it was so interconnected um, until I got here and realized really how interwoven the arts and sciences can be. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And now moving to a little bit of a different side of art, we have a student who is really curious about your, you know, page turning, you know, sheet music turning device. And they're wondering, are you a musician? Is that where the idea for this came from in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not a musician anymore, I would say, but I did take piano lessons for like eight or 10 years and I played clarinet in middle school. So I have some experience, right, with this problem. Um, but this is actually part of a class where you're on a big team of 20 people. So we work together to come up with this idea and we talk to people in the community. We weren't just thinking about, you know, what are the problems that I face in my own life, but also, you know, let's talk to the people in the community and hear about different pain points in their experiences. And so one of the people we talked to was a musician who mentioned like, I have a really hard time every time I'm playing, I have to like stop, turn the page. And it's, it kind of ruins the experience for other people. If I'm performing during a concert, I'll hire somebody to sit next to me and actually physically turn the page so I don't have to stop. So it's this crazy thing. And, and we decided that was a really interesting route for us to pursue, but many of us had musical backgrounds. So it helps when we were kind of thinking about different concepts. Sure. And I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, communication is just such a huge aspect yeah, of making absolutely. all the way from ideation to actually making the the darn thing. And, and, you know, working on that ride, you were kind of the bridge between the engineers, yeah. the, the artists and designers there. So it sounds like communication is such a crucial aspect of this. What are, absolutely. you know, what are some ways that you think Nord Anglia students can start practicing that communication, developing those tools? Yeah, I think one of the best things to do is, you know, if you're coming up with ideas for things, practice talking about them, but also practice like making a quick sketch. People say, write a picture's worth a thousand words. A lot of times 
that's so true when you're trying to communicate an idea. We naturally, you know, you see me like using my hands and talking all the time. Like that's what we kind of tend to do. But it's also so useful if you you have an idea in your brain and somebody else is also thinking about it to actually put something down on paper. It really helps you kind of come to a consensus. But I would also say just generally, you know, practicing giving presentations and, you know, talking and um, just communicating in your daily life. It's it's so useful for just a lot of those life skills in general that are so important and kind of almost undervalued sometimes until you get to a later stage where now you're having to learn things from scratch because you didn't have a chance to practice them earlier. Of course. And, and it sounds like as in, in the course of, of making and that whole even, you know, design process and, and ideation process, you know, you're, you're learning a lot of new skills. This is very, very applied. So one of the skills you, you might have to learn is like sometimes a project doesn't work out. Have you had any projects of yours fail and, and how did you move forward, you know, facing things just not working out? That's a really good question. And actually failure and iteration, it's like one of the most important pieces of the design process. And I've even done some research about that process. Um, but essentially it's really interesting. I think we kind of motivate people not to fail until they you know, throughout their education. And then all of a sudden, if people are learning design, you're expected to test things and break things and iterate and use little models that are not perfect at all to um, test concepts out. And a really, really positive thing is if something doesn't work, you're like, okay, that's really, really, really great, actually, because now I know that's not a direction I'm going to invest a ton more time and energy into. And that's a reason that we use kind of this simple sketching and prototyping early on. Because if you say my first idea is going to be perfect and I'm going to build it all the way and then I'm going to test it and it doesn't work, that's a much bigger heartbreak than if you say, okay, I've sketched it, I've made a little model and now I'm realizing that this is fundamentally not going to work. Let me pursue a different direction. Um, so yeah, that's that's really kind of the motivating thing actually behind my, behind my research is to make sure people are having those failures early because then it's a lot easier to course correct versus getting so attached to something and, and not testing it and waiting until the end. Right. So it's clearly like a very normal part of the process and, and really right. integral to, you know, just building yeah. and designing in general. Yeah. And, you know, in, in that same vein, you know, you've, you've faced failures, you've made some incredibly successful projects. Do you have a favorite project you've worked on of all the amazing things you showed us? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's so hard. It's so, so hard to pick favorites. Uh, I think, you know, the the ride that I mentioned is very cool. Um, you know, I only had a small role in that, but it's very cool now to kind of see that at such a finished scale that I can actually go on this ride and, and you know, be like, oh, I actually worked on this. Um, but on a smaller scale, I would say the page turner is something that I'm really, really proud of, especially because it was such a big team. It was my first time working with that many people and it was a phenomenal kind of experience working with them. and we pulled off something crazy within the course of a semester to build that. Um, and so that's something that I, I would say I'm definitely super proud of. Oh yeah, no, that is, that is way cool. Um, switching gears a bit. We have a question um, from Ayana and she's in the fifth grade and Ayana's asking, you know, she's really interested in mechanical engineering and making, and she's wondering if you could give her a few tips on how to get started. Yeah, that's a big question, Ayana. Uh, I'm glad you're thinking about it in fifth grade. That's that's really phenomenal. Um, yeah, I would say start by, you know, start with what, thinking kind of creatively with the things that you have access to, like what are little projects that you can do? You know, what are problems that you or your friends have experienced? And then start thinking about like, if I were to solve this, what would I need to make? And then try, you know, just try stuff try making things, you know, even if it's with cardboard at home or, you know, really, really simple materials, look at what you can make. I would say there's, oh, there's a lot of really cool resources out there, you know, on YouTube and things like that of people making crazy contraptions out of household materials. I think that's something that is really important that you don't need to have access to all the fancy stuff in order to be a maker, in order to be an engineer. There's really phenomenal people doing amazing engineering work who, who don't have any of that. And so um, I would encourage you to kind of experiment with things, maybe try making like a Rube Goldberg machine or something like that, experimenting. Um, yeah, I would just say like, you know, get your hands dirty and build stuff and and then start to also think about what are the problems that you're noticing in the world around you. And I think that's a really key part of thinking like an engineer. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I've had the 
unique pleasure of, of making a Rube Goldberg machine back when I was in school. And that was really, really fun. Could you just tell Nord Anglia students what that is? Um, because yeah. I think they want to make one after hearing it. Oh, absolutely. Um, Rube Goldberg machines are very, very cool contraptions, essentially, that you are basically really, really overcomplicating a simple task. So maybe your task is like, I'm going to fry an egg and you will set up something maybe around your entire room that like this ball will roll down a hill and bop something and that's going to spring something else into the air and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden the last task will be that an egg will be cracked and, you know, flipped into a frying pan. So you're trying to accomplish that task, but kind of do it in the most complicated way possible. And right now, actually, a bunch of MIT students have formed a club and they're trying to break the world record for the longest Rube Goldberg machine. So they're trying to make one with like the most modules um, to try and break this world record. So we'll see if that that works out. Stay tuned. Wow, that is that is super, super neat. Uh, we have a, a question from Avni and she's in, in 4A and, and Avni's wondering, overall, do you like what you do? Are you having fun? It's a deep question, Avni. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I feel like it's very, very cool for me to kind of get to do things that are kind of all the different things that I've been interested in, right? And to bring that in. And, you know, as a grad student, I do a ton of writing. That's another thing that I really love to do in general. Um, and so I'm all of a sudden getting to do like making and writing and art and, you know, engineering and all of these things that I really love. Um yeah, so I'm definitely happy with what I'm doing, and it's a very exciting experience. I, I I totally love that, and I can hear the the passion in your voice as you're describing all of this. So that's that is totally infectious and and so cool. We have a few students who are really interested about um, your experience as an undergrad, and they're wondering were there certain things in in school, like high school or before you actually got to MIT, that really prepared you to get into this environment, to start making, to start thinking out of the box and, and communicating? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. You know, it's like, it's very, very tricky to think, think backwards in that way and think about what got me prepared. I think one of the biggest things that I didn't realize, I think a lot of times there's this conception about MIT that it's like, you know, all the science and math nerds and, and that kind of thing. And actually it's a very kind of artistic place. So I'm super happy that I kind of continue to nurture my love for the arts because that's something that really kind of got to springboard when I was here. You know, I really started doing art more seriously. I started um, on a dance team. I started doing all these things that were beyond just kind of who I was as a academic person. Um, and that was so, so valuable for me. And so I think generally just, yeah, really thinking about my passions and pursuing my passions was, was the thing that helped me. And yeah, I don't know if I have kind of a, a stronger answer than that, but I think, you know, figure out what are the things that you actually really love doing. I think if you know this idea of flow, it's like when you're doing something and you lose track of time and all of a sudden many hours have gone by and you are just so engrossed in what you were doing. I think find the things that put you into that flow state and like, really nurture that um, because I think that will tell you a lot about what you love to do and, and what you want to continue to do in the free future. I think that's really, really good advice, Rima. I think something that's been common of all the really amazing folks we've invited for MIT Abstracts is they pursued something that really caught their attention, that they were passionate about. It wasn't like there's no strict list of activities you need to do to get into, you know, a, a place like MIT. It's like following what you love and what really makes you tick and those passions. Um, so I, I think that's, that is really, really good advice. Um, Smyan is asking, did you have a role model before you came to MIT? And if so, can you tell us about them? Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, Smyan. I have a lot of role models. I was really lucky to grow up in an environment where, you know, a lot of my close family friends um, are folks who came from India to the U.S. for grad school. And so there's a lot of people who took education really seriously, a lot of really strong women. Um, but then I think, again, you know, bringing it back to this arts and sciences thing, I, a lot of people who are like, you know, scientists or engineers in their field and also pursued some kind of arts in a really kind of intense way. Um, including, you know, my own parents, I would say, you know, my dad is loves to, he's a mechanical engineering professor, he happens to be. Um, and 
because he, he does mechanical engineering, I came into undergrad saying, I'm not going to do mechanical engineering because what my dad does sounds so boring to me. Um, but he also is, you know, he's an artist and he loves to write poetry and he loves to do theater and he loves to do all these things. And so I saw that example in him of, you know, kind of nurturing both of those sides of him. And I think I got that example over and over again from, from these different people that were a big part of my life that um, led me to think that that was acceptable because it really wasn't something that was necessarily encouraged in school. It was like, okay, if you're on this academic track, you're going to take all these classes and you don't have time to do all the electives and stuff like that. But that was something that I still really wanted to do and was able to do because that was something that I saw modeled for me. So not one person specifically, but this entire kind of collective group, I would say it was a really, really big role model for me. That is really, that is really wonderful. And I think, yeah, we can learn and be inspired by many different people throughout our educational journey. So I think that's really that's a really special privilege to have. Um, so I'm getting a lot of questions in the Q&A from Nordic English students who are totally excited about maker spaces, <laughs> um, you know, how to get into them, how to start making things. And we have a question from a student that says, like, what are some common mistakes um, people make when they're first getting into a maker space and trying to build things? Yeah, I think I would say in, in terms of a common mistake, what I see happening sometimes is like people they're excited about a makerspace. They get involved in some way and then they go in and they're like, well, I'm new to this. And I'm seeing people who have been doing this for a long time, doing really, really complicated projects. And now I feel kind of overwhelmed and I feel a little bit intimidated because I know that I'm not at that level yet. And so then sometimes people will retreat and they'll say, you know what, maybe I'll, I'm not going to do this right now. I would say kind of push through that initial hesitation and fear and know that like it's, life is a journey, right? You will, if, if that's what you really want to do, like you will learn and you will grow and you'll be able to do the crazy things that other people are doing. Um, don't kind of get into that mindset of thinking just because, you know, you see somebody else doing something and sometimes it is true. Like, yeah, the first day you walk into a makerspace, you're not going to be able to make whatever crazy thing that somebody who's been there for 20 years is going to be able to do. Um, but if you work on it for 20 years, you'll get there for sure. So I would just say, you know, persistence for sure. Yeah, a combination of, of patience and persistence there. Yeah. Now we have a question from um, Sumya Jit, and Sumya Jit is wondering, what's the impact of, of makerspaces on students in the pre-college level, and should makerspaces be, you know, in every middle school? What do you think about that? Yeah, I love that question, Sumya Jit. That's like, you know, so up my alley, like I mentioned, I was a makerspace teacher. Um, I I think it's really important. I think I keep coming back to this idea of like the way that we do school right now. A lot of times we don't let people kind of explore their interests outside of the sort of strictly academic space where it's like study and take exams and do this. And I think that kind of creative outlet. And I think also the physical understanding is so important. I know plenty of people who, you know, are great engineers, but they just, you know, you give them a physical thing and they don't know how it works. And you, if you only know the theory, it goes back to that mind and hand, right? Um, and I think it's just so good for your brain to actually be working with physical things and and interacting with things in that way. And if it were up to me, I would say, yeah, have have maker spaces in all the middle schools, have it in the elementary schools, um, just start as early as possible. Because I also think that that element that we talked about of failure, um, it's something that gets drilled into us pretty young that like, oh, don't mess up, don't you know, don't make mistakes. And I think experiences with making and with design are really, really helpful in getting out of that mindset and realizing that that's like a natural process. Natural part of design is to like learn from each iteration and you're trying to make it better and actually failing gives you so much information. If something works and you don't know why it works, it's not great. But if it doesn't work and you can figure out why it doesn't work, that, you know, you will have a much better understanding of what you're creating. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I wish we could stay and ask you all of the awesome, really great questions that Nord English students have asked. But I know Rima actually has to run to class after this. So I'm going to ask one closing question um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. So Rima, I think you've inspired so many future makers today. I can, I can just tell based off of all the, the conversations about the challenges and, and getting ideas and, and design process. What is some advice you can you can leave them with? Is there any advice you'd like to impart to just send off these this next generation of, of makers? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, I've said some of these things before, but really like try to figure out what are the things that you really, really love to do and spend a lot of time doing that. And, 
you know, think about what kind of a person do you want to be in the future? And like, what do you need to do now to, to get to that point? Right. Like if you really love something, what are the things that are kind of analogous to that in different ways that are things that you can explore now? I think that's really helpful. And then I would just say, you know, get out there and build stuff. I think I, we were talking about the Rube Goldberg machine and making things out of household materials. Like it's such a fun, fun thing to do and a really great way to get started with understanding the physical world around us. Um, and getting getting a little bit more into the making spirit. Yeah. All right. So go out and build stuff. That's yes. that is the place to, to start and to continue from from here on out. So Rima, thank you so much for spending some time with us today, telling us all about maker spaces. I want to share with the Nord Anglia students, you know, where they can find a recording of this if they want to go back, listen to to things, learn about the Rube Goldberg work a little bit more. You can find a recording of of Rima's presentation um, in our Q and A discussion today on Global Campus and in YouTube soon, uh, as well as the recordings for our previous abstracts, all of which are are similarly very inspiring. And I wanted to make a note to invite folks to join us next month for an abstract on, on language and words featuring Anna Ivanova. I think that's going to be really, really exciting. Um, before we leave today, I just want to give a shout out to the people who make this amazing series possible, the MIT Nord Anglia Education Collaboration. Especially, I want to thank Rima and all our amazing guests for joining us. Thank you so much, Rima, for sharing your time with us today. I'm, I'm really inspired. I'm going to go and make some stuff in the lab now, for sure. Amazing. <laughs> Love to hear it. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to chat with you all. Thanks for the phenomenal questions as well course. Well, good luck in class, Rima. Hopefully we'll catch you again sometime soon. Perfect. See you all later. All right. Goodbye. Bye.